thank you very much for being here. It's a pleasure. Uh, Lisbon is obviously one of the great cities of the world. You know that. It's a fantastic place. Um, and just using the word culture, I'm talking first about the creative economy, culture, how that connects to the creative city. Of course, Lisbon as an artifact is a cultural artifact which communicates through every fiber of its being. So any creative economy strategy has to reflect that character distinctiveness personality that is essentially from here, Portugal, and, and, and so on. The danger with all these strategies is that they can be imitative. But anyway, you know all that. Um, Paolo also mentioned that you know, other cities are doing this. The interesting question that I hope we discuss is how do you make the most of being behind? Because in a way, that can have advantages. And it would be interesting to talk with you about what those advantages might be. Now, what's in a name? It's quite important. When this all emerged, this debate in the early 80s, people talked about the cultural economy, and that had a certain sort of political frisson in it, that phrase, and it was quite sort of provocative, in a, I think, in a rather positive sense. And the British government then, in 1997, brought out a report where they used the word creative economy. I'm not sure that's really good because at one level it can make people feel who are not in this particular sector feel, well, I must be very boring because I'm not part of that sector. And of course, as we know, creativity is more widely spread. Um, there is another term that used to be used, which I still think is quite good, which is really the industries of the imagination. But anyway, we're using the word that we have. I remember back then uh, in talking about all of this in the early 80s uh, in the UK and elsewhere, you know, people were sort of saying, oh, this all sounds very vague, it's all a bit unclear, it's opaque, do you mean this is a serious stuff and so on? And the definitions were sort of fuzzy and kept on moving until people at some point sort of broadly agreed uh, the characteristics. But I think what we can say is that these sectors, these industries, obviously have something to do with identity, the resonance of a place, the image, but also because of the whole move towards a more experientially driven economy, uh, they have a central contribution to make, as you know. And of course, wherever you go, people talk about soft power. So this obviously connects to soft power as well. So those issues, um, I'm, I'm sure you're all very aware of. Um, I mean, the whole notion of spectacularizing the city is, is at one level interesting, at another level perhaps too much. So it, it really all depends. Uh, this is Venice uh, at, at the Biennale period, and that's certainly quite interesting, I have to say. I'm not suggesting you have zeppelins floating around uh, Lisbon. Um, but another question which I think we should put right at the front, what's the aim? Is it about developing the creative economy or is there a bigger aim, which I think there should be, which we can discuss a bit later, creativity in the economy as a whole? So I just leave that question floating there for a moment. Now, I want to just go through a bit of the trajectory from how this whole sector moved from the margins more to the center, if you forgive me. And I remember 1984, uh, when we were doing the first studies on this, on, on this issue, people really were saying, you know, what the hell are you talking about? You know, we were trying to knock on the door of various institutions and get inside. We were trying to get inside government and that door was essentially closed. We could never get round the table. Um, basically, there was an element of, in a sense, of exclusion and misunderstanding. And what people didn't really understand then but they understand, of course, more now, is as one moves towards a more knowledge-intensive economy, it is really many things that are intangible uh, uh, that, that are significant, and many of those things that are intangible, of course, uh, developed often through the creative economy, um, that, 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 that really add value. And the other problem was always, 
that the financial sector never really understood how this operates, how this sector operates, and therefore it was very difficult, particularly for startups, to get going. So these issues still remain, as you well know. Uh, the financial sector still seems to think it's, again, rather unimportant, often lifestyle businesses, and so on. So what one could say, it was an uphill struggle, but clearly at some point I would say around the beginning of 2004 around things became different. And in the case of the UK, it was quite interesting. It was all spurred uh, by the whole shift and restructuring in the economy that we all know about, the shift towards ultimately Asia and so on and the way production processes change dramatically and, and, and thus the economy also too. And in particularly for, for the UK, there was a certain moment which was interesting, which was to do with cars and the motor industry, um, which of course, as you know, has completely declined in the UK. But the break point, the decisive breaking point was when, when our government realized that the exports of cars was less than the exports of the music industry. At that moment, people paid attention. So that was one significant moment, which was to do with exports. And of course, I know there's an advantage of UK music in that sense. So you saw companies, this is Rolls-Royce, you know, declining, whereas the music industry and other sectors, of course, grew in that process. The other very important issue, which really made a dramatic difference, was initially people had just looked at the fragments. They might have looked at performance, dance, music, design, uh, video, um, filmmaking, television, whatever, the elements. And, of course, looked at those fragments and thought, oh, well, they're very small, and so on. But once one could point out the interconnections which there are, of course, between these sectors, as you well know, if you're producing a record, there are many of the creative industry sectors that are part of that, you suddenly see there's a connection. And when you see the connection, you also see the contribution being much larger than it initially was. And that varies depending on the city you were in. In London, it happens to be very large. In New York, of course, and so on. But in general, in capital cities, in general, it tends to be 6 7 or 8%. So that suddenly then became significant. The other particular link, which again is very well known, was the link between those sectors, perhaps particularly the more artistic end of it, and urban regeneration. What do you do with all these old buildings that are hanging around? How can you fill them up again? And many of these buildings, like this one I'm just showing, one in Rotterdam called the Creative Factory, now have more people working in them than they did when they had a factory, but based on completely different sets of activities. And what's so amusing for me is these places, which are essentially horrible places inside, where horrible working conditions are now, of course, the places for the hip. This is uh, a typical co-working space. There's about six companies uh, working in that particular image. But that, of course, is again quite well known, but it definitely, obviously, made a massive contribution to the revitalization of economies. The other thing was that a number of people were actually rather inventive. Again, I'm using a Dutch example from Tilburg. There's this textile museum there, and I thought, oh, Christ, not another textile museum looking at old machinery. But the museum, run by someone who said, I have nothing to do with museums, I'm an anthropologist, created a center for the development and creation of new textiles, and there is a showroom in there as distinct from uh, a museum shop. So anyway, that's another sort of overarching trend that was very common. At the same time, there was this welter of evidence being created. I, I once, about four years ago, tried to count how many pieces of evidence from cities about the sector were, and I lost count. I don't know what it was, 150. It doesn't really matter. But there is this mountain of evidence. Now, what's interesting is levels of evidence. It's quite interesting that the creative economy needs more levels of evidence to be taken seriously than if I talked about nanotechnology where there's often nothing there at all. And that, again, I find quite significant, the way in which this sector can be sometimes completely undervalued. 
But of course, you know that when we're discussing, let's say, the creativity of places, the elements are, obviously, some people think the creative place, a creative milieu is one which is sort of artistic, you know, just has artists. And of course, we want to fill the city with artists. And of course, the artist makes an incredibly interesting contribution. But it's not necessarily the totality of, of that sector. But of course, the art sector itself I just did a study of Mayfair, London, where the turnover of just selling art is 700 million pounds a year, which is sort of reasonably a large proportion of, 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 of the economy. So even the traditional arts themselves are tradable products and services, but particularly art, and I'm using art just as one example, has become really a source of capital as well for another other set of purposes. So there's a whole series of things that begin to fit together that nowadays, as distinct from then, begin to sort of pump up the desire and the desirability of this uh, sector. And of course, you know it's a vast sector. I'm not going to go into details, but you know, this is a picture of a company in Shenzhen in China, which is an animation studio. And you know, there are 3,500 people working in it. So just to give you an idea, let's not compete with them. Let's do something different, of course. Um, but you get the, the, the drift. And of course, again, like we talked, uh, the word clustering was mentioned earlier. Of course, these things tend to cluster. But it's quite interesting when you look at the different particular forms, like music. This is the music cluster in Istanbul. They tend to like certain types of places, which are sort of slightly fine-grained and intimate. But again, these places, this I'm moving to another city, Amsterdam. This is MTV's European headquarters. Again, it's in one of these old structures where they've retrofitted uh, the, the, the place. And again, I'm just building up the picture a bit. Even those traditional things like craft, this is now London Origins, which is a major craft event, has really fed on the whole idea of the reinvigoration of the movement of making, the making movement, which obviously Fab Labs is one manifestation of. But that in, its, in itself is only a beginning, and even in the States now, people talk about the fact that they're manufacturing again in, in the States, partly because people, you know, all developments have their flip side, so virtuality, not being able to touch things, obviously generates the opposite as well. So part of this again, and in time, led to the spectacularizing of the city, fashion, all of these things, and, uh, and we can see that uh, in Lisbon as anywhere else. But there are some interesting examples of using the techniques from within the creative economy, like this is the uh, Emscher Park area in the Ruhr, the industrial area of the Ruhr, which has actually, I think, done very interesting things in a sense, blending the past into the future, using this sector as part of the driver to, to help that. And if you look at the European Center of the Creative Economy, you can read a lot about the developments in that region. And I suppose we have to then end up again with design, which is moved to some extent from the specific thing, and of course you know about that, uh, from just designing objects and so on to design thinking, uh, designing policies and so on. So all of these, the essences of this sector are sort of invading everything else. And here just in passing again, this is the old Nokia factory. More people work here now than they did in the old factory. 800 people work in that, whereas before it was only 250. So again, interesting. And I think there are also some very interesting interventions. And quite often, smaller cities are uh, where you're using public uh, assets in an interesting way. Um, Arnhem has a very good fashion school. And what the city has done with some of its social housing is at the bottom to allow students coming out of it to have their shop and production in on the street. That has led to further developments. Uh, for example, in this case, the music industry has moved in. So all I'm really talking about here again is clustering processes. But the key point about this development, and I only think that's a good development, is that it is not only purely consumption driven. The danger, of course, with spectacularizing the city is it's all about shopping and so on. 
A further person needs to be uh, mentioned here, which, as you know, Richard Florida wrote, wrote a book called The Rise of the Creative Class, which talks about some of these people, artistic people, designers, etc., and also people involved in, you know, software design and so on. He, again, typically has his office in an old building in, 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 in Toronto. Now, the danger of this and this type of development is, again, it creates groups of people which excludes others. And for me, uh, just coming from where I come from, I'm more interested or equally interested in the bigger, the holistic view of a place, a city, where ordinary people, the other 70% who are so uncreative, make the extraordinary happen if given a chance. Because when you look closely at a city, you can see that it's lots of versions of creativity, often connected to the creative economy, that make interesting developments occur. And of course, this economy has acted a bit like an R&D zone, an R&D zone for the evolving economy, because the way things like theater work, when we look at detail, how it works, sharing, cooperation, and all of that, if we just look at the mechanics of, let's say, putting on a, a theater play or a film and so on, it's very much the way that we now see some of the more mainstream economies. So that methods of working thing is quite important. The other point about it is really a very significant development, which again I think you'll be aware of, which is to do with crossover innovations. And just taking one example, serious gaming, the essence of gaming is various forms of knowledge, but the serious gaming aspect is its application. Its application, for example, in helping people with autism. Its application in health fields and so on. So I want to begin to start th getting us to think beyond the sector. Now, clearly, one of the big issues that's emerged is there's this set of ideas that in most places there's a lot of it, and they, they need spaces. And space, if you think about it, has become one of the most significant things around. I'm not saying you create places called chaos room, but nevertheless, there are places called the chaos room. But generally, this happens to be the Philips factory in Eindhoven, which is a very interesting co-working space and very successful, um, uh, is one of the obvious models. And I, I know you've got some as well. Um, you certainly got startup places. I just saw this this, this this morning. So, you know, you're not behind. You're there. <laughs> the things are happening and so on. Um, but... Let's look at something that I personally find interesting. Let's look behind what each sector means. I think sector thinking on its own is not quite enough. Of course, you have to start with the sector, say we are important, we exist, and all of that. But if you look behind music, there's sound. If you look behind plastic arts, there's visualization. If you look behind, obviously, film, there's image, there's movement, and so on. And what you find, and my first realization of this, is if you look behind the sector, there's much more. I remember working in, in Perth, in Australia, and looked at the mining sector, and I found that actually in mining, there were many more people from this supposed creative economy sector than actually you know, shifting soil and, and, and so on. And if you think, for example, of how you discover oil on a seabed, it's to do with sound technology and so on. I know that might not be satisfactory for someone who wants to uh, write a piece of music, but nevertheless, uh, that, 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 there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot there. So all of these things, in a sense, begin to reveal that we've got an area that is of utmost significance. And, I mean, this is just a, a thing in Taipei and Taiwan, which is, again, to do with visualization, which is to do with how we see communities in new ways. It might look mad here, but when you're actually in, immersed in that, uh, it's quite an interesting uh, experience. So therefore, if you consider sectors, many sectors, and I've looked at quite a few of them, certainly the first three, uh, chemical processes, medical diagnostics, logistics, e-commerce, and so on, you can see that these skills in, within them are increasingly migrating to the skills associated with those people trained in the, in, in the, in the creative economy. 
Currently, many of the people in that are engineers, and we have nothing against engineers, but uh, a few engineering minds linking with a few artistic minds uh, can do no harm. So if you look closely at logistics, obviously you know there's a lot of stuff going on that's to do with, with, with the sector we're, we're talking about. Now, I think, though, the creative economy has something even deeper than that. And I think this comes back to the point I mentioned earlier, which is about the identity, the story of a city, how you make meaning. And I think that shouldn't be forgotten, which is why I started by saying that this sector was initially called the cultural sector, culture broadly defined uh, in the sense that I'm, I'm looking at it. So these other aspects of storytelling, driving participatory processes and so on, I think are equally significant. Some people would say, oh, that's all social stuff. But actually, when you're trying to regenerate a place, you precisely need some of that uh, social development and so on. Now, in this whole general drive I'm trying to describe, there is uh, obviously partly a danger, as it says here, a danger that, 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 that things become mu museumized. And therefore, adaptation is incredibly key. This is just an example from Roubaix near Lille, where there was a swimming pool. Uh, the guy said, I'm moving somewhere else. The guy said, I want a museum. So he put the museum in the swimming pool. Now, that actually is quite a good project because in the water they have fashion shows, not inside the water, although they may be doing swimming trunks, um, but generally you know, they put wood there. But all I'm trying to say is when you look at it in this way that I'm beginning to tell you, everything sort of becomes a resource for in, in, in reinvention. But now I want to just focus a bit on the trendiness aspect of that, because we all know that these types of places, this is the Lernbrau in Zurich, and that sort of rather dull looking building in the back is the business school. And that Lernbrau, of course, has been turned into uh, an arts place with lots of things going on. It's the headquarters of Hauser and Wirt, which is the third biggest gallery in the world by turnover and so on. And it's also next to the area where things like eBay, you know, you can recognize the names, they're all very high-tech companies. And it's really reacting against the typical classic techno park idea, which people feel has not got enough urbanity, urbanity in the sense, the best of what a city offers, the capacity to meet, connect, and, and, and so on. So these developments are okay. You can see them here in Berlin, where you see this very flashy building next to the very famous squat called How Long Is Now, next to a Kunsthalle, which you know is a sort of uh, artistic space. So all of these things are not without contention, because of course uh, gentrification processes occur a lot. In addition, the idea, you know, the art, fashion, luxury nexus has uh, added another dimension as people have realized, you know, how do you make buying a pair of shoes, how can a shoe be more than a shoe? And this is all, of course, as we know about branding and all of that, which is, again, tends to be globalized brands. Uh, how many Bulgaris do you want to see, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's about, obviously, uh, in a sense, shopping. And I come back again to this point about also um, production. I mean, you probably had this here as well. Louis Vuitton in the autumn last year had that good link, or interesting link with, with Yoyo Kusama, who I think is a fantastic Japanese artist. But again, here's a sort of dilemma. What is it? Is she the artist? What's she doing? Is she selling the clothes? They all sold out. They all had dots, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not straightforward. The same is happening with Prada, Tiffany, and so on. And also, talking about shoes, Ferragamo. Ferragamo in Florence has a museum. Ferragamo sold shoes to Marilyn Monroe, had a very interesting exhibition about Marilyn Monroe. Again, nothing really wrong with it, but I just think we should be aware of this interesting interconnection between art as art and art in some sense used for commercial purposes. But the other dimension of it is, of course, that these companies, like Gucci, another museum, the Gucci Museum, is trying to give itself, obviously, more status, credibility, and so on. 
Some of these things are playing themselves out. I'll just use a London example in Shoreditch. In Shoreditch, you know, in East London, uh, where the, the London Design Festival takes place. That's what it's called. And it says here, the world's first pop-up mall by, will open here. Unique, ma uh, what does it say? Unique mix of international fashion, arts, and lifestyle brands, galleries, and cafes. What more do you want? I don't know. But... Um, could make you happy. Um, but anyway, you can again see what the environment's like. It's next to the old Truman's Brewery, and there's a very interesting graffiti um, uh, around. I love this one. Please wait here until you are useful. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I'm just showing you that it's happening everywhere. Dumbo, you know, is apparently New York's creative capital. Paris has just built this thing, which is its major fashion uh, center of excellence. And even Singapore hasn't done it. It had all these companies in containers, but because the price of land is so high, they took the containers away, and there's this sort of sad exhibition of all these companies that are so interesting and all you see is their signs as they move into some really disgusting office block. But anyway, all of this is about, as we know, generating vitality. And of course, the sector is one of the main generators of vitality, of magnetism, of generating some sense that here is a place I, I, I want to be. And that, of course, is in some ways the bigger purpose. So every city in these competing cities you show are really trying to show themselves to be central to somewhere. And of course, I should have put there the South America and Brazil in a very, very big, big red spot. But that's what cities are trying to do. And there's nothing wrong with that because one obviously wants to be a central place. Now the question is, can Lisbon be part of the nexus of, let's say, the top 25 cities that in some sense control uh, 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 the, the world. I seem to have left out London. Oh, no, I did put in London. I thought I missed out London. It's not that good in London. Um, but anyway, the question is, is within this set of networks and transactions and communications nodal points, can Lisbon and can this strategy, and I think it can, contribute to some new sense of centrality of some sense that this, this Lisbon is a compelling place. And that's very different from China here, Beijing, where, I don't want to be negative about Beijing, but it does have to say originality square. So we'll be unoriginal everywhere else, except here where we'll be original. I mean, that's how I read that. I also saw this in Sao Paulo, which said pavilion of creativity, and I thought, at last I found creativity in Sao Paulo, or not, as the case may be. <laughs> um, so anyway, creativity doesn't work in that classic way by just putting a, a label on things. I think another issue we must mention is really the question of icons. This is the latest global icon, Hamburg, Herzog de Muren, who did the Beijing Stadium and Tate Modern. This is the Elbe Philharmonie, 13 stories of apartments. Below is, is the concert hall. It went over budget 20 times. That often happens with mega projects because you compel people to get in and you say it only costs 30 million euros. You're already committed. No, it's 60. Oh, no, it's 90. Oh, it's 200. Oh, 600 and so on. So the icon strategy is difficult from my perspective. I think there's always been a complete imbalance between investment in hard infrastructure, equipment, or whatever you call it, and, and content. And oops, I nearly jumped over that because I discussed this with you earlier. <laughs> because I did see the CCCB building, and I thought, that's a bit depressing, seeing Carlsberg there. But that's my problem. Um, but I just asked myself a question, and I take everything into account you said to me earlier. What would the impact have been had the same amount of investment been in people's skills and entrepreneurship and everything you've said? Wow, I think Lisbon would be on the map. And so whatever you do, and it would be on the map, because I think the main drive always has to be your own version of this distinctiveness. Because, you know, we're saying it's all so cool, but have you ever thought about the word Soho? We're moving to Soho. Soho coffee shop. 
Soho Bar. There was a Chinese restaurant in Riga in Latvia I saw the other day, Soho. Then I went to Beijing, Soho Galaxy. Huh? So even these things, yes, Soho obviously means south of Houston Street in New York and in London. It has a location. It was always historically for 150 years a really creative area. But the whole process of branding, of course, then reduces the level of distinctiveness. And I'm just using the word Soho. So I hope there's no place in Lisbon called Soho. Promise me. None. Excellent. So whatever it is, it's got to be your version of Soho. Certainly not Soho Galaxy. I mean, these Chinese, they're really brave, aren't they? The Galaxy, not just Soho Bar. The Galaxy. Um, anyway, one of the key messages, and this may be, I don't know what, I don't know if the cultural person is here, what I mean by cultural person, the cultural vice mayor, is this question of, I don't know how culture and economy works. Uh, in Birmingham in 1986 or 85, they set up an overarching committee called the Arts, Economy and Culture Committee, which actually merged, not merged, but brought these two departments together in a joint conversation. So there has to be, and particularly in view of, of, of um, the austerity we're in, a more relaxed attitude about commercial, non-commercial, even though the logics, of course, are completely different. But I think one has to face the, uh, those dilemmas. They just exist. And I've already mentioned that point about production and consumption. Not more to say. But one thing I think is really interesting is what happens when the big money moves in. In this case, the Financial Times is supporting all sorts of activities. And those agendas, of course, may be your agenda, but they may not be. And having a level of confidence about this is really key. And we heard this morning a fantastic example from Berlin where they've set up a new system where people who want to invest, versions of Financial Times, have to bid to invest in interesting projects. So there's been a level of confidence for the cultural creative sector to say, hey guys, it's not, we're, just, we're not going to just go like that. You have got to go through our assessment, our version of risk assessment, just as much as, as, as they doing it to you. Now, I don't know if you can read this, but this is fantastic. This is Zurich. There's a new Renaissance hotel. The whole area has been transformed. There's only one building left of the last, and this is about gentrification. And an artist has put the word resistance in exactly the same typeface as as, as the Renaissance Hotel. So this picture encapsulates for me, in some senses, the dilemmas that, that we're facing in these development processes. Now, I want to just broaden out for a moment, and I'm just going to look over here to see if I'm on time. Ah, I've spent zero time. Ah, oh, good. Um, uh, that's good. So I just want to look closely at the uh, creative, what I'm calling the creative imperative. I want to broaden this out, this argument I've made that is derived from within the creative economy out to the city. So why is there this imperative? I, of course, think it's a matter of survival. It's a matter of survival. It's urgent. This graffiti in Tel Aviv, it's one minute before midnight. Whatever way you want to put it, I think it's really a key thing for a number of reasons. In part, it's due to gl with global positioning which obviously this was perhaps more the center of the world, perhaps we are going downhill, and obviously the rise of the East in one way. So that is just one, in a sense, not metaphor, but one point about that shift. And even in China, there's the shift, that old guy looking as if he's going downhill and the woman looking as if she's going forward. And even in these sectors we're talking about, there's intense competition and the products that emerge from it, all the containers arrive here, never go back, which is why three million containers, which are empty, ex uh, are floating around European ports. So the dramatic transformations that we're talking about, you all know about, um, you know, agricultural, da di da di da and so on, industrial, to the knowledge economy. But what people have realized is how do you get knowledge? How do you get an innovation? You only get knowledge and innovation if prior to that 
you have had some creativity in order to generate the knowledge and then the innovation in the first place. And that's one of the big reasons, I believe, that realization, it, it, which is why people have ha, created a greater focus on this area. So innovation may be to do with doing things just on time and in very perfect ways and absolutely fine advanced manufacturing and all of that. But again, coming back to the design thinking notion, I thought it was quite interesting the other day. I saw this in Toronto. It was the Toronto Stock Exchange, and all the signs had been taken off. Guess what it was being? It was changed into a design exchange. I mean, I know this is only, again, a metaphor, but it's a metaphor for what is more valuable, which form of capital is more valuable, just purely financial capital, or the capacity to create sensory objects of which clearly the iPhone is, is, a, is, a, is, is one of the key objects. So a lot of this is, of course, about ideas, and these processes some people find very invigorating, Others find it completely the opposite, very frightening. You can see, if you look at the world of graffiti, these, the, the, the responses to these transitions, you know, the chaos thing has been going around for years, as well as the pain one. But I thought this one was particularly interesting. I saw in Liège, which said, capital in equal chaos. Right, that's fine. But the next one I thought was a bit more interesting. Anarchy equals order. Now, I'm not saying either are true, but what I'm saying is in relation to the response of a young person who's 18, uh, it raises quite central issues, um, big issues indeed. And the main one to me in relation, which you know I don't need to tell you, is that whereas 15 years ago people went to the job more educated people, certainly, and then the city. The job was first. Now people choose the city and then the job within the city. So what the city is like becomes absolutely key. And if we call this group of moving people talent, I don't particularly like the word talent because it assumes there's a group of talented people and a group of ignorant people over here, but I'll keep the word talent for the moment, um, is really about how you make this place such that they don't leave. And I know many have left, and I heard your prime minister, someone said, had said, everybody go, I'm not sure. Someone sent me an email, said I should say that. Um, but anyway, um, thank God I remembered that. Um, anyway, the point being, although I'm talking about cities, I'm not pretending that this is some revelation because cities have always been creative. This is Brunelleschi in Florence. Can you imagine the innovation required to actually put that together, you know, I don't know, 30 meters up in the sky? Incredible. Uh, or, or the Sagrada Familia, you know, all of that's just another version of, of creativity at a certain moment in time. The difference is that we are now self-consciously saying that creativity itself is a resource whereas it wasn't seen as a specific resource independent of all sorts of other resources like capital and labor. But in order to trigger this off, I believe even prior to creativity, it's necessary to create an environment of curiosity. And that, if we're dealing with the public sector as well, and indeed the private sector, requires organizational structures that are quite open that allow the creative mind to flourish more, which is, of course, a mind that is more fluid and flexible, in my view, knows when to be closed and when to be open. So it's not all about just having new ideas. And so if you put this in a cycle, you'd probably say the priority is to generate curiosity, out of which there may be imagination, out of which creativity may evolve, out of which an invention may emerge, and, and when applied widely, it would become an innovation that leads to a further grouping of that cycle. And such a place, which I'm hoping Lisbon is or will become, finds imaginative solutions and opportunities to any issues or problems that emerge. And so what we're really talking about is actually a creative ecology. So part of this, and we've already seen it within the creative economy, is about things like rethinking, conceptual rethinking, creative bureaucracies, technological innovations, artistic ones, new business models and social innovations, and so on. 
which is essentially a culture of creativity, so rethinking. That, of course, is incredibly difficult since most systems, organizational systems, are so rigid. It means the rethinking saying, and we discussed this over lunch, Arthur, is the way a crisis could become an opportunity because it forces people to sort of get outside of their uh, accustomed box. And it means as well, in the context of the city, rethinking the rules and incentive systems to make things happen. Very interesting piece of Russian art, I just remind you. I'm sure there's a bit of rethinking needed too. Um, so what those innovations might be, they come from various sources, but the key thing is that they somehow connect and mix. You know, you might rethink architecture. Here's an Italian city that is built into the rocks. It's called Matera, and they call this negative architecture because it isn't outside, it's all inside. But anyway, you know all about that, you know, things like open source innovation, new ways of collaborating with companies and so on. So I don't expect you to read this, but basically when you say that, it's quite broad, the scope I'm talking about, the applications are broad too. It could be techniques, processes, procedures, the way you implement something. Even the open data movement is a creative innovation at some sense. It's taking participation to a new level. The different mechanisms for networking in all sorts of ways, from Petra Kucha to whatever, are in a sense many small innovations that help. The whole notion of the smart city is a useful innovation in a sense of using ICT to make livability in cities simpler and easier. The fact of using old factories to become universities, in a sense, is an innovation. And in that way, you could say that creativity is a, you could say it's a, a currency. And indeed, given everything I've said, really, the creative economy and all this other stuff I'm talking about is like electricity. You could not run an economy without, uh, without it because it adds value to every transaction and so on. So therefore, from a city perspective, we need to switch the question from what is the value of design, art, the creative economy, and all of these things? Not what is the value, because that puts you on the back foot. It's a much more interesting question. What's the cost of not? So I'm incredibly keen on that other question. I never ask the first question, what's the value? I always ask, what's the cost? But if we're talking about this wider culture of creativity, culture this cultural perspective that is focusing on distinctiveness and so on is usually not our operating system. And this other invisible hand, not of the market, doesn't work strongly enough. So let's look at this just a tiny bit more closely. We know the world's in motion. We know it's a smaller place. We know that different cultures are coming together in different ways that might have diametrically opposed views of life and who we are. We might be having a global culture that on the one hand is interesting, on the other hand is incredibly homogenous and boring. And we might say all of that, if we put everything together, could be called a paradigm shift in terms of how a city should work. And that does indeed put cities at a crossroads, because I think they have to rethink. We have to drag out the old thinking about cities. We have to remind ourselves that in the last period, last period, 150 years, the way we thought of cities is basically in terms of hardware. The people who build the hardware are usually the people who have been in charge. And that leads to all sorts of places that are undesirable. That's not to say that engineering is bad. I call this whole process the urban engineering paradigm. Of course, things need to stand up, but there is something else missing, which is absolutely essential if the creative economy is to flourish. And as Albert Einstein reminds us, the thinking that got you to the problems you have, da -di da -di da will not be the thinking that gets you to where you want to be. So if we say there was a city called 1.0, there might be another plan, plan B, which is city 2.0. 
I'm only using that silly computer language because it just helps me give you this talk. But the difference between the first and the second is the second blends in hardware and software thinking and organizational rethinking simultaneously. It understands that the city is an emotional experience that is the key driver. It understands that how places work, how we generate space and place that people want to connect and meet requires a different sense of a sensuality, understanding how soulfulness works, how you generate atmospherics, and in a sense how you well, I happen to like this picture, but what I mean is how you redesign. There's an old innovation, the Eiffel Tower. There's a new hydroponic building next to it. So that's the type of thing I'm talking about. And some of these new spaces are so much, this is Adelaide Airport, is so much like what you've already done. If I just took a bit of this, you could say, oh, that's a typical thing we did 200 years ago. And that's why I think there's so much potential when I, as an outsider, uh, come to a place like Lisbon. But this rethinking of cities might be very trivial and simplistic, like here in Tirana, where the grey buildings were painted. And it's absolutely clear in this building, which is showing the direction to the airport, which direction the airport is. So you get the idea. So what we're trying to do, not we, the world, is trying to get that rich combination between the intimate, the village feel, and that opposite sense of that worldliness. And great cities tend to have that unique combination. And you can see this retrofitting conviviality everywhere. This is uh, Chicago Millennium Park, just as one example. This is Chungi Chung in, in, in Seoul, where they just took away the motorway, recovered the river, and it's now become the central point of meeting. You can see this in New York, the new High Line, uh, which has become the most popular thing in the city, a railway on the top where you glide through the city, and where the mayor made the city so much more walkable, and so on. And you may be saying to yourself, why are you telling me this? We've already got this. And I agree, you have already got this, which is why I'm building up to an argument of the incredible potential of, 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 of Lisbon. So perhaps we should really be talking about 3.0, because in fact, this thing that I'm talking about now, place and space and atmosphere and so on, if you look at the older model of thinking through how economies worked, it was very much one idea, one production, one distributor going to households. But now it's much more to do with small entities connecting, creating alliances, creating then also interesting supply chains and distribution mechanisms, virtual, physical, and so on, leading to the consumer. So just visually at a graphic level, you can see and we can feel the changing nature of the economy. And part of that, of course, relates to the here-there phenomenon, where we are here in space, but there somewhere else simultaneously. And that creates a level of instability, the sort of notion of the pop-up culture, where nothing, everything seems to melt into air, where even here, this is a cultural institution in London, which has a pop-up restaurant inserted in it, which is very exciting, but at the same time, there's often that sense of um, uh, anchoring. So here's a German invention, which is an office that you can move around. And these offices and places, which all reflect the nomadic world we live in, of course, are incredibly strong within the creative economy sector. The notion of open source, which of course has affected other industries, very much was I, I would say, more taken up within the creative economy sector first than others. And this requires an environment, of course, which is back to that point about openness, openness in every sense to cultures and so on, to mixing cultures like here, Japanese and Chinese art mixed together in one. And here, Amsterdam has a one-stop shop, uh, which is an expat center, which somehow, I'm not saying it's perfect, but at least it exists, makes it easier for foreigners to come in and find their way through. So what we've talked about is rethinking resources, rethinking planning, redesigning city making, and particularly getting beyond the silo. None of this works 
with rigid departmentalism. None of this can work um, if, if that's the case. So that is one of the main organizational requirements. If this new urban story, let's say, of a Lisbon is to be told, it will only work with the sort of things you said about collaboration earlier in your talk. Because a lot of this is very fragile. It's not easy to manage because we're moving from a situation from planning the known in a predict and provide model to planning for the unknown, in a sense, by ensuring one can remain um, resilient. And this is the spirit of the times we live in, I believe, for good and for bad. And every city, this is the Shanghai Expo, is asking itself this question, how can I, when this is happening, blend nature, the city, new forms of living together, suburbs and centers, and how can I create some new, more, better ideal of a new urbanity? And I think one of the solutions may be, I'm not sure which, is the sort of platform you are beginning to develop, your creativity platform, which I think in time will widen. But it requires that sense of different parties coming together that come from different um, areas that are willing to give and bring to the joint conversation. And if you summarize all that together, and I'm near the end, you'll be pleased to know. Um, if you take everything together and say, what are the five points of a great city that is both creative and livable? Livable, not Liverpool, Liverpool, <laughs> Liverpool's okay. Is it would be a place of anchorage where tradition and stability in the past are there, as well as a place of possibility, which is the opposite in some sense, a place that connects internally and externally, a place that allows you to self-realize and self-improve and occasionally inspires. And I think those principles are, relatively speaking, cross-cultural and true through time. So certainly having some sense of a past, I think, is wonderful because it's a source, it's a bedrock from which to develop the new. And that new may be like here in the Library of Singapore, a possibility room. Lots of people went in there. I don't know what they did in there. But nevertheless, typically Singapore, we have to name it the possibility room. But then that connection, which of course you've got, I don't know, I've forgotten how many cultures you've got, but bridging those differences between cultures, finding ways of learning and being inspired. Now, we try to, all I've really said is the great city has differences. It's calm and lively at the same time. So, unfortunately, much of what I've said is not possible to do because the economic dynamic tends to stop people building the cities they love. Many of the new things that are being built have nothing to do with the sort of dialogue and, not dialogue, I'm giving you a monologue, I'm sorry. I hope we have a dialogue in a minute. But it does require a degree of courage and willingness to bend the market. Now, we've tried to work out a method of just some points, and I'll just highlight finally these points, of measuring the pulse of a city in terms of its creativity. And there are 10 areas, and I'm just going to mention them. The first is, is the political public framework, its regulations and re re regime and incentives regime, open and flexible and positive about this? Secondly, what's the degree to which the distinctiveness and vitality can come out? Is, thirdly, the city more open than closed in terms of its character? Fourthly, is entrepreneurship, private, public, social entrepreneurship, etc., allowed to come across? Is the city strategically agile? Does it know where it's going, but is willing to be strategically principled and tactically flexible? Is the learning landscape, and I saw those figures you showed earlier, how broad is it? But more importantly, are these people talking to each other? Is there communication within the city itself? How is the place being made? We know it's fantastic, as it is, but what's the new stuff like? Is it just as good as some of the stuff we admire from the old? How livable is it in terms of facilities and resources? And perhaps most importantly, do people here walk the talk? 
It's one thing talking about creativity. There's another thing doing something about it. And here, my final point is I think the biggest asset of European cities is their urbanity. And urbanity, of course, is a classic idea. You know, Italian medieval cities began that whole notion. Can the city region, and when we talk about creativity, it has to be the city region, be a model of that? And here, I think the creative economy can help in each sector. Urbanity is, of course, the right to the city and responsibility for it. So it's a two-fold process. So a shared commons, that is a major area where the creative economy helps. It's beyond the self. It does all these things. It helps libraries work and so on. Secondly, this cultural literacy point, which I've talked about a bit, where difference comes together. A Catholic woman talking to an imam. She's got the Quran. He's got the Bible. Eco-consciousness. I mean, there's so many things from within creative economy knowledge that can help the city become green. Healthy urban planning, planning that makes you healthy rather than you having to go to the gym. I saw this American city which said we're a walkable city. What they actually meant was walking on these machines because the city is not walkable. Fifthly, the aesthetic responsibility. Because in the end, I haven't used the word ugliness and beauty a lot, but a lot of this is about discussions on ugliness and beauty. And this building is Helsinki's building. Alvar Aalto built it. It was voted the worst building in Helsinki and the best. Fantastic, because then we can have a debate about what is good and bad. And I've already said creative city making. So do you want the Dubai model or the Lisbon model? And lastly, an invigorated democracy. So that means for me, the city is really like a work of art. Plato said that, but I would put living in. Thank you very much.